Dear Wenny, I died too. Not when the truck hit us, but after, in the hospital. I had a broken leg and a ruptured spleen, and I was bleeding inside and outside, and while they were trying to fix me, my heart stopped for a whole ten minutes. I sped through a tunnel when I died, then I flew around in the sky. I'd be flying up there with you still if Dr. Westfall hadn't put paddles on my chest and shot electric energy into my heart. Once my heart started pumping again, the doctors gave me an operation and filled me up with new blood so I would stay alive. And when I woke up, I found out you didn't come back like I did. I asked Mom if Dr. Westfall used those electric paddles on your heart, but she just started to cry and had to leave the room. So you're flying around up there in that good place, and I'm stuck down here at Children's Hospital, all bandaged up. Day 10. Dear Wenny, today is the 16th of October. It's been 10 days since I died and came back. That's why I wrote Day 10 on the top of this letter. I want to keep track of how many days I've been alive again. One bad thing happened while I was outside my body, but I want to talk about the happy part. I still have good feelings from the time I spent inside the light. It's like that good, bright light leaked into me while I was up there, and I brought some of it back. I'd be completely happy if you'd come back too. We could talk about what it was like to zoom through the air and do loop-the-loops in the sky. I miss you, little sister. Sometimes I think about you being dead, and I have to put the pillow over my face so nobody will hear me crying. Day 11. Dear Wenny, All day long, nurses keep coming in, saying, Hi, Will, how's the leg? Okay, I say, which is a total lie. Then they take my temperature and blood pressure and shoot medicine into my IV. In case you want to know, an IV is an upside-down water bottle on a pole. Medicine runs down a long tube and into a needle that's stuck in my left hand. If you think I'm having trouble playing video games with a needle jammed in the back of my hand, you're wrong. Today, I played Zorgon Tracker and killed a gazillion Zorgons. Day 11, again. I tried to tell Mom and Dad what happened when I died, but it didn't work out so good. Mom sat down and covered her face. Dad didn't cry like Mom. He just grabbed my bed rail and stared out of the window. With his dark hair and pale skin, he looked like one of those black and white pictures he takes. I'll try to tell them some other time. Right now, I'm wiped out. Day 12. Dear Wenny, the truck driver sent us an I'm so sorry card. The card says his brakes failed when he was going down that steep hill. He was honking for us to get out of the way. He swerved and tried not to hit us, and he's so sorry. The card made Mom cry. Dad stood with his hands on her shoulders and clenched his jaw like he was trying to crack a gobstopper. Day 13. Dear Wenny, I couldn't talk today. I knew if I tried, I'd cry. I know you're happy zooming around up there in that warm light, so you probably don't miss me like I miss you. I miss you like a big, empty space torn out of my guts and nothing can patch the hole you left. If I'd stayed dead and flown farther in to meet that light person with you, I'd be in heaven right now. I'd be feeling fine. I, I wouldn't have this pain. I wouldn't have to look at Dad's face. His eyes are like his dark room at home, no light in them at all. When he looks at me, I want to punch his face. Then maybe he'd get mad and I'd see something different in his eyes. Only it's not Dad I want to punch, it's you. I want to punch your face for leaving me alone down here. Oh, I'm sorry this letter is so messy. You can show it to God if you want. You can mark it up with his red pen and give me a big fat F for all I care. Day 14. Dear Winnie, you're probably wondering how I got hold of this blank book to write you letters in. Well, one of the youth leaders from church came by to visit. His name is Mr. James. I've seen him eating donuts after the service a couple of times, but I don't really know him. Well, he walked right over to my bed and started talking like we were old friends. Hi, Will. Your mom and dad wanted me to drop by. He pulled a chair up to my bed. 
How are you feeling? When I didn't answer, he said he knew about the truck that hit us, how it shattered my shin bone and killed you. He said it must be hard to have a little sister die like that. I stared at the bird mobile over my bed. Mr. James was quiet a while. He took off his glasses and rubbed his nose. Then he pulled a little book out of his briefcase. I keep this book to write down my thoughts, he said. Sometimes I write about my day. Sometimes I even write letters to God. He read me a letter about an eight-year-old kid who got lost in the mountains. The kid wasn't found until he was frozen to death. Mr. James was really mad at God about that, but I think he should have been mad at the guide who took the family hiking in the first place. I didn't say anything, though. Before he left, Mr. James put an empty book by my bed. He said I could write my own thoughts inside. I could write to God if I wanted to. I could write mad letters or glad letters, anything I liked. I don't know God very well, so I figured I'd write to you. Day 16. Dear Wenny, Mom and Dad come to visit every day. They don't look so good. I know Mom's pregnant and that makes her grumpy, but she used to wear pretty clips in her blonde hair. Now she forgets to put on her lipstick. Also, she ties her hair back without even brushing it first. When she bent over to give me a kiss, I had to tell her she'd buttoned her shirt up wrong. I mean, Mom's a high school science teacher, for crying out loud. I didn't want Nurse Biscetti to see her shirt all done up wrong. She might think Mom was dumb or something. Dad wasn't much better. He still looks like all the color's been sucked out of his face. Also, he kept his raincoat on the whole time he was in my room, like it was gonna rain in there. After a while, he put a blanket over me and rolled my wheelchair outside. The IV pole has wheels on it, so he could roll that out, too. Dad's raincoat came in handy once we were outside. It was cold in the courtyard, but I was glad to smell some real air. I looked up, and I saw a big hole in one of the clouds. There was a white light behind it, kind of like the hole I flew through when I was dead. It made me remember how happy I felt up there, zooming along behind you through that warm air getting closer to that bright light. I leaned my head way back, wishing I could rise up into the sky again. See that hole in the clouds? I said, pointing. Dad jingled his keys. Looks like rain. I didn't want to talk about rain. I wanted to talk about the light coming through that hole. I was thinking about telling Dad what happened when I died. Not the bad part, just the good part. Then a big kid came outside and spoiled my alone time with Dad. The kid had a heavy coat on over his hospital pajamas and his hair was sticking out sideways. Pretty soon he was pacing in front of the flower box. Then he stopped and talked to the maple tree. Who's he talking to? I whispered. No one, said Dad. A nurse came outside and walked him back into the hospital. I was glad to see him go. What's the matter with that kid? I asked. He's having some sort of delusions, said Dad. What are delusions? That's when you believe you see things that aren't there. How do you know they're not there? Because no one else can see them. Day 16 Don't worry, Dad said. I'm sure the doctors in the psychiatric unit will do their best to help that kid get well. I'd heard about the psychiatric unit on the third floor. I checked the clouds again. The hole was gone. It didn't matter. Telling Dad about zooming through that dark tunnel and seeing the light person in the afterworld didn't seem like such a good idea anymore. Dad might think I was having delusions. He might want me to go and talk to the doctors on the third floor. Day 17. Dear Wenny, there's a new kid in my class this year, and guess what? He's here at the hospital for a bladder operation. He's a big, fat, red-headed kid with freckles. His name is Gallagher Crumley. 
The doctors wouldn't let Gallagher have any food today, so he watched me eat instead. It was kind of like eating in front of our dog, Bullwinkle. You know the way Bullwinkle thumps his big black tail and lets his tongue hang out halfway to Spain whenever you eat crisps or jelly beans in front of him? Anyway, I could swear Gallagher's eyes are the same color brown as Bullwinkle's. Day 17, still. Dear Wenny, it's really late. Gallagher's asleep, but I'm wide awake, so I thought I'd write to you some more. I remember when I first died, there was this velvet dark I went through before I flew into the light. Did you go through a dark tunnel like that, too? My tunnel was totally black at first, but it was a good kind of black, so I wasn't afraid. It wasn't at all like the cement tunnel at the edge of Jackson Park, even if the kids do call it the Tunnel of Death. Remember last summer when you and I were messing around at Birch Creek, and Thad Stickney dared us to go into the tunnel? I never told you, but I was really scared. I mean, the tunnel has to take Birch Creek all the way from Jackson Park, right under the town, till it comes out again behind Mel's Market. Thad spat on my trainers. Chicken. I was surprised when you took my hand and tugged me into the opening. Hey, it was dark in there, wasn't it? But there was light coming in from behind us. At least there was until we turned the third corner and you stopped your singing and started screaming. We weren't even holding hands by then, and I couldn't see you, so I didn't know if a monster was eating you or what. Come on, I shouted above your screaming. And when you bumped into me, I thought you were a monster instead of yourself. So I screamed too. I was glad when we made it out of the tunnel, and you told Thad I'd saved you from a monster dog. Thad started treating me different after that. I never thanked you for making me look brave in front of Thad. So, I'm thanking you now. Day 19. Wenny. Gallagher got back from his operation today. He says he feels terrible, but you should see him eat. He really knows how to pig out. We've got a contest going to see who can get the most desserts. You're only supposed to circle one dessert on the menu, but we've both been circling all four. Tonight, Gallagher got two desserts, an oatmeal raisin cookie and a double fudge nut brownie. I had macaroni, meatballs, chocolate milk, but only one dessert, lime jelly. Mom came in. She was looking a little better. Her hair was brushed. I stuck the macaroni in my mouth so it looked like yellow fangs. Chew and swallow, said Mom. I held up a chunk of jelly and looked through it. Mom was green. Gallagher was green, too. Put that down, said Mom. She opened my milk box for me. I'll get you a straw, she said. While Mom was gone, I pressed my meatballs down with my fork till they looked like fake turds and scraped them into my bedpan. Mom came back in with the straw and saw my bedpan. Oh, she said. She hurried off to the bathroom and flushed my meatballs down the toilet. <laughs> Gallagher laughed so hard he got orange juice up his nose. Day 20. Winnie, Gallagher's parents come by every day, just like Mom and Dad come to see me, but it's different when Gallagher's parents come. For one thing, they joke around with Gallagher. They tickle his feet and mess up his hair, and they bring him comics to read. For another thing, they sit really close to each other by Gallagher's bed. They hold hands. Sometimes Mr. Crumley kisses Mrs. Crumley right in front of Gallagher and me. When the Crumleys left today, Mom and Dad came to visit. I wouldn't have minded if they'd gone right back home. It wasn't like Dad was going to tell me jokes or give me comics. It wasn't like Mom was going to waste any smiles on me or tickle my feet. They hardly even talked to each other. Day 21. Dear Winnie, aside from you, Gallagher's the weirdest kid I've ever met. Today, he put a pair of pants on his head and sang, Underwear man, underwear man, doing the things that underwear can. Day 23. Dear Winnie, Gallagher has these Dracula teeth. He puts them on whenever Mr. Sweeney comes by to get a blood sample. It makes Mr. Sweeney laugh. I wish I had teeth like that. Gallagher was reading one of his comics this morning. Then he looked up at me. Hey, North, you ever been down the tunnel of death? I got a cold feeling on the back of my neck. 
Thad Stickney's gone in as far as the fourth turn. So he says. Yeah, said Gallagher. His eyebrows were stuck way up like he was really impressed. And Mark Johnson saw a ghost down there last summer. Tell me something I don't know. So, have you ever gone inside? Sure. How far? I've gone past the third bend where it's really dark. Yeah? Well, I'm gonna go farther than that. My sister Wenny saw a monster dog down there, I said. Gallagher tossed me a comic. Check out the death tunnel on page 24. It was a story from a real Greek myth about Orpheus, who goes down a tunnel to the underworld to bring his wife back from the dead. Most people can't go down the death tunnel while they're still alive, but Orpheus uses his great musical talent to get in and charm all the weird monsters in the underworld. Orpheus charms Cerberus, the flesh-eating monster dog. He even wins over the Gorgons and the Hundred-Headed Hydra. Hades, the ruler of the underworld, likes Orpheus' songs so much he says he'll release his wife, Eurydice. She'll follow Orpheus back up to the land of the living on one condition. Orpheus must not look back to see if she's behind him. If he turns around to check her out, Eurydice will slip back down into the dead place. Well, Orpheus is all happy. He says he'll do just that. But what do you think he does? He walks for a while, playing his music. Then, just before he comes out of the tunnel... He looks back, and he loses his wife forever. I couldn't believe how dumb Orpheus was. That story's all wrong, anyway. I bet the people who drew the pictures have never died before. All Orpheus does is go down a tunnel, cross the river Styx, and hang around in this murky, dark place, singing to monsters and talking to shadow people. When I died, I flew. And it didn't stay dark. It was only dark in the beginning. Day 24. Dear Winnie, Gallagher went home this afternoon, so I'm all alone in my room again. The only good thing about the hospital now is that I get waffles every morning for breakfast. The 31st of October, day 25. Boo! Nurse Paschetti dressed up like a witch today. She even draped fake spider's webs over my bed. It made me miss Igor. I asked Mom and Dad if they could go home and get him, but they said the hospital was no place for a tarantula. I said, what's the big deal? Igor's clean and quiet and small enough to hide under my covers. Dad said, exactly. Mom helped me put on my Frankenstein costume, and I went trick-or-treating in my wheelchair. I took the lift and visited all the hospital floors. I got a glow-in-the-dark skeleton, a vampire bat key ring, some stickers, and a ton of spider rings. There were baskets with stuff on every floor, but no sweets because lots of the kids are too sick to eat them. Luckily, Gallagher came by and shared some of his sweets. So, that's my Halloween so far, Winnie. Definitely the weirdest Halloween I've ever had. Day 27. Hey, Winnie, I'm home. Bullwinkle met me at the front door, wagging his tail so hard, it made a drum beat on the door. His breath smelled like rotten hamburgers, but I let him kiss me anyway. You know how hurt his feelings get when you push him away. Bullwinkle followed me around while I tried out my crutches. Twinkie was in the living room, sleeping on top of the TV as usual. She was all curled up, so she looked like a dirty snowball. I tickled her behind the ear. Twinkie yawned and curled her pink cat tongue. Next, I visited Igor. His tarantularium has been moved from your room to mine, so I can take care of him. I lifted the lid and gave him one spray mist of water, just like the book says. Bullwinkle gave him a friendly bark. Igor just sat there looking the same as always. The only time Igor gets excited is when you drop live crickets in front of him. Twinkie came in. She jumped up on the dresser and watched Igor do nothing. Twinkie's been wanting to get her claws into Igor for a long time. Mom unpacked my hospital stuff. Dad stood in the doorway with his arms crossed. I'm glad you're home, he said. But he was looking out of the window when he said it. 
like he was talking to the maple tree. Day 28. Dear Wenny, it's different at home without you here making noise. Too many quiet people live here now. Dad used to play the Beatles on the stereo, used to come home from work and go jogging with Bullwinkle or play frisbee with us. Now he just heads downstairs to his studio. I don't know what he's doing in there. He won't show his new photos to Mom or me. I guess your dying really screwed up Dad's business plans. I mean, he makes enough money in his Photoshop downtown, taking pictures of babies and old ladies. But Dad used to have bigger plans, remember? He's got all those black and white pictures of us, years and years of photos that he's been retouching for a big gallery show someday. I don't know if that show can ever happen now. He can't take pictures of us anymore. It's just me now. Just me on my crutches with a clunky blue cast on my leg. Not exactly a pretty picture. Day 28, again. Dear Wenny, I came back into my body to stick around here so Mom and Dad can have a son and we can be a family. I felt so strong about that when I first came back, like I was doing the right thing, but I didn't know it was going to be so hard. I keep trying to cheer up Mom and Dad. Today I made them crackers with whipped cream and sprinkles. Remember how you fixed that snack for them last spring? Remember how they made a big deal out of it, giving you kisses and saying you were such a thoughtful girl for making treats for the family? Well, I didn't get any kisses. Dad said, well, thanks, but I'm not hungry. Mom ate only one. Then she made me wipe the counter while she swept the sprinkles up off the floor. I went outside and sat on the lawn chair. I ate two treats and gave one to Bullwinkle. He wagged his tail and slobbered all over my lap. It's nice to make someone happy. Day 29. Dear Wenny, I thought maybe Mom would start looking better when I came home, but she still looks bad. Really pale, and her hair's all stringy. Her eyes are red and puffy. And she's skinny, except for where the baby is growing inside her. When Mom sits at the kitchen table and looks at me with her puffy eyes, I know just what she's thinking. He should have watched over Wenny like a big brother. He should have pulled Wenny out of the way. He shouldn't have let that truck hit her. I can't stand it when she looks at me, her eyes crying hard without any tears coming out. Day 31. Dear Wenny, Today was my first day back to school, and my armpits are killing me. Who invented crutches anyway? I mean, why don't they have jetpacks for people with broken legs by now? Kids followed me around all day, wanting to sign my cast. Even my teachers wanted to sign it. Lunch was just like always. They're still trying to make the school lunch seem like real food by giving it fun-sounding names. Today, we had sled dogs and snow. I'm not kidding. That's hot dogs and creamed corn. I guess the creamed corn was supposed to be the snow. Well, it sort of looks like snow after Bullwinkle has peed on it. Day 32. Dear Wenny, I'm angry. Here's why. As soon as I opened the wooden box where I keep all my special stuff, I saw that my best magnet was missing. So that meant you took it again. My magnet should have been easy to see because it's shaped like a horseshoe and the plastic part is bright red. I looked everywhere for it. That's when I noticed some of my warriors were missing. I couldn't find Super Droid or Gamma Guts anywhere in my room. Then I went out and checked the workshop in the garage. Nothing. Darn you, Wenny. You take my things all the time and you never put them back. Day 33. Dear Wenny. It's strange to think it's been 33 days since the accident, and this is the first time I've gone in your room. I guess I've been avoiding it, but then so has everybody else around here. I found Super Droid on the rug by your dresser. Then I spotted Gamma Guts, and something red sticking out from under your pillow. I thought it might be my magnet, but it was just a pair of heart-shaped sunglasses. Your teddy bear Milton was lying on top of your covers. I gave him a pat. There was stuffing coming out of his armpit, 
and toilet paper wrapped around his arm where you were trying to make him feel better. I remember when you put that toilet paper on him. You spread toothpaste on his hurt spot to ease his pain, and you said he'd be in bear hospital for at least a week. Maybe you felt bad for Milton because you were the one who tore his arm in the first place. When I was poking around your toy shelf for my magnet, Twinkie and Bullwinkle came in. Twinkie had the kitty snake in her mouth. You know, the one full of catnip and peanut shells we made out of Dad's old sock last summer? She was having a good time with her toy until Bullwinkle took it away. He growled and shook the kitty snake back and forth. I grabbed the snake's tail. Come on, let go, you dumb dog! I tugged hard. Peanut shells and catnip went flying everywhere. By now, Twinkie was hissing, and her white fur was sticking up on her back. Put it down, stupid! I yelled. Dad came out of the study and stood in your doorway. What are you doing in there? Looking for some stuff, I said. Then Mom came down the hall with a stack of science papers. She saw the peanut shells all over the floor. What a mess, she said. Get these animals out of here, said Dad. When he took my best magnet, I said. I still haven't been able to... William North, said Dad. But he wasn't looking at me. He was looking at Milton. He crossed his arms and took deep breaths. I'll get Twinkie, said Mom. Come on, you dumb mutt, I said. Bullwinkle followed me down the hall to my room. Now I can hear Mom vacuuming up the catnip. I don't know where Dad is, and I don't care. I'm stuck in my room with six warriors and no magnet. And it's all your fault. Day 34. Dear Winnie, no one talked much this morning. The only person who seemed happy was Twinkie. Ever since Mom cleaned up the catnip, Twinkie's been acting really friendly to the vacuum cleaner. Anyway, I was glad to leave for the day. The school started pretty well. We even had pizza for lunch. But something happened in the last half hour of the day in art. Mrs. Terwilliger came up with the dumbest project in the history of dumb school projects. First, she unloaded a pile of baby name books on the front table. She made us get into small groups and look up our names. Then we were supposed to draw pictures that showed what our names meant. Thad, Camilla, and Gallagher were in my group. Thad, whose name means courageous, drew a picture of himself fighting a big, scary ghost with a silver sword. I don't think you can kill ghosts with swords, since they're already dead. But I didn't say anything. Day 34. Camilla drew the best picture she could of herself, which wasn't really all that good. She made her face a lot prettier than she really is, and her hair much longer. Her name means the perfect one. Can you believe that? I've got to tell you, Winnie, I've seen the perfect one pick her nose and stick the bogeys under her desk when she thought nobody was looking. Camilla's got a long way to go. Gallagher's name means eager helper. When he finished drawing, he wrote eager helper next to a picture of himself handing me my crutches. The picture made me feel all sweaty in the armpits. I looked up my name. Will, short for William. It means fierce protector. I wrote my name, but I couldn't think of anything to draw. I looked at the clock. Eight more minutes and school would be over. Mrs. Terwilliger came over and breathed down my neck. Fierce protector, she said. That fits you, Will. I started shaking like I was cold, except I wasn't cold. I wanted her to go away, but she just kept leaning over my desk. Have you ever rescued an animal that was hurt? You could draw that. I picked up a purple crayon and started peeling the paper off it. Mrs. Terwilliger squatted down next to my desk. Fierce protector, she said again. By now, everybody in the whole world was staring at me. I knew just what they were all thinking, too. <laughs> Fierce protector, right. He really protected his sister. He pushed her out of the way of that truck. Yeah, he saved his little sister's life. Like, right. The last bell rang, 
and something went off inside my head. I dumped the basket of crayons into Mrs. Terwilliger's lap, grabbed my stupid crutches, and hobbled out of the door as fast as I could. I was out of the gate and down the street by the time Gallagher caught up with me and grabbed my shirt. Mrs. Terwilliger wants you to come back to class. School's finished, I yelled. Let go! No way, North. She sent me out to get you. She's worried about you. Who cares? I don't have to go back in. School was over for the day. Mrs. Terwilliger will have to give me an F for that assignment. I don't care what she says. I'm not drawing any stupid name picture. Not now, not ever. Day 34, again. Wenny, we had chicken, rice, and Brussels sprouts for dinner. Barf. Mom wasn't talking to Dad. Dad wasn't talking to Mom. I wasn't talking to Mom or Dad. I didn't know until now how much of the talking you used to do around here. You'd say dumb things like, Who made this pickle? Or, What color is God's hair? Or, How did cows feel about ice cream? Dumb. I mean, really dumb. Not even funny. Dad would just about die laughing. Pretty soon we'd all be laughing. Bullwinkle would run around the table knocking forks on the floor with his big bushy tail. Things are really different around here now. It's so quiet you can hear the forks clinking on the plates. I was getting sick of that clinking sound, so I decided to tell a joke and maybe get a smile out of Dad. What did the happy ghost say to the sad ghost? Dad blinked. Mom stopped chewing. Keep your spirits up. Mom put down her fork. Keep your spirits up, get it? Ghosts? Spirits? Dad scooted back his chair. Go to your room, Will. What? What did I do? Go! I went to my room and slammed the door. Typical. You used to make Mom and Dad laugh without even trying. I tell one joke and I get sent away from the table. I'll never eat another dinner with them again. Day 35. Wenny. You always knew how to get away with stuff. Dad hardly got mad at you at all the day you tried out your new catapult and cracked my window. Do you know water leaks into my room from that crack every time it rains? Or how about the time when you drank pickled onion juice and barfed all over the kitchen floor? How come Mom and Dad made me clean up the mess? Okay, I unscrewed the lid for you, but you were the one who said you could drink the whole jar. No one ever thought you were bad because you looked so cute. Your little round face and curly blonde hair had the grown-ups completely fooled. Especially Dad. If you ate all the cookies or spilled orange juice all over the floor, you just work up a few tears and ask to sit on Dad's lap. All the anger would go out of his face when he saw your tears. Pretty soon he'd be reading you a story or tickling your tummy till you giggled. I tried your trick one time after I broke a glass. Dad shoved a broom in my hand and said, Clean up this mess and don't be such a crybaby. Day 36. Guess what, Winnie? Mrs. Terwilliger ratted on me for dumping those crayons on her lap. She called home. She thinks I need help. Now Mom and Dad have made an appointment with Mr. James. You know, the guy who visited me at the hospital? It turns out Mr. James works at the family counseling center in town. Now I know why Mom and Dad wanted him to come and see me at the hospital. Pretty sneaky of them. Mom and Dad wanted me to go to his office and talk about what happened at school. Why can't people just leave me alone? Day 38. Dear Wenny, Mom drove me to the family counseling center. I was feeling pretty nervous. I was thinking if Mr. James tested me and told Mom and Dad I was crazy, I'd end up on the third floor of the children's hospital, sharing a room with a kid who talks to trees. I decided I'd better act totally normal no matter what Mr. James said. The first thing he did was ask me why I dumped the crayons in Mrs. Terwilliger's lap. It was an accident, I said. He raised his puffy eyebrows above his glasses. So, you didn't mind the name assignment? Nope. I looked up your name, he said. It's not as bad as mine. Calvin means bald. You're kidding, I said. Your parents must have been psychic or something. He smiled and ran his hand over his shiny head. So, did Mrs. Terwilliger say something that upset you, Will? No. I stood my crutch up and spun it around. Mr. James fiddled with his pencils. 
He's got 17 colored pencils sticking out of a Daffy Duck cup. I counted. How have things been going at home? asked Mr. James. His questions were making my insides squirmy. I knew I had to be really careful. I mean, if I told him how bad it is at home, how the air in the house feels like it weighs a thousand pounds, how I'm angry with mom and dad for being so sad, how you totally screwed up my life by dying, what would happen then? I'd be locked up in some padded room on the third floor for sure. So I said, it's different at home. How? he asked. My heart was pounding like I'd just done the hundred meters. I took a slow breath and stared at his ear. Just different, I said. Day 40. Wenny. Gallagher came to our house this afternoon, and we had a spitting contest in the backyard. Gallagher can spit ten feet six inches, but I can spit fourteen feet two inches. We used the measuring tape from Mom's sewing kit to measure. Bullwinkle was really excited by the contest. He stole Mom's measuring tape and ran around the yard with it till Gallagher tackled him. I think Bullwinkle wanted to join in the contest, but he can't spit. He can only drool. We went inside for lemonade, and I showed Gallagher my new book, Houdini Escapes. He read through the seance chapter, the part about how Houdini's wife tried to contact his spirit once a year on the day of his death. My sisters have a seance practically every time they have a friend staying overnight, said Gallagher. They've been trying to contact famous dead people, like Elvis. Any luck? Nope, said Gallagher. I guess Elvis thinks he's too important to visit our house. Day 41 Dear Wenny, Today I sat in Dad's stuffed chair reading Chapter 3 of my new book, Houdini Escapes. In the next room, Mom had the radio on while she mopped the kitchen floor. A Curtis Ray song came on, the song Mom and Dad used to sing to you at bedtime. Bright-eyed girl, you flew into my heart and set me free. No one could love you as much as I do, my bright-eyed girl. I came to the doorway. Mom was holding the mop, totally not moving at all. Bright-eyed girl, spread your wings and fly away with me, sang Curtis Ray. Dad rushed down the hall and flicked off the radio. Click. Everyone just stood there, like statues in the park. I could hear my heart beating inside my ears. Then Dad headed for his dark room. Mom went into the bathroom and locked the door. I stepped into the empty kitchen. Sunlight came in from the window onto the wet floor. I could see myself in the shiny linoleum. It was like there were two of me. It made me think of when I was dead, and I floated in the corner of the hospital room, looking down at myself. It felt so good floating up there. I was even smiling at the doctors working on my body down below. They seemed so serious when they used those paddles on my chest. And they were moving really fast, like they were in a speeded up movie. I haven't smiled like that for a long time. Now I'm stuck down here, looking at myself in the wet floor. I have to hobble around on these stupid crutches. I have to stay in this normal body with two plain old arms and a cast on my leg. It's different for you. You're up in the sky. You're flying around just like the bright-eyed girl in that song. It makes me wonder if I did the right thing by coming back. I know how sad mom and dad are about you dying, but it's like they don't even care that I came back. Day 41, again. Dear Wenny, if you'd come back instead of me, you could have sung some of your stupid made-up songs like Alligator Jam and made Mom and Dad smile when they were feeling sad. And if you didn't like the way they were acting, you could have had one of your big tantrums. You could have screamed and stomped your feet and hurled your toys across the room. You'd know how to get them to pay attention to you. Me, I tell a joke and get sent to my room. Today I tried to sing the barf song to Daddy. It's a great song Gallagher taught me in the hospital. It starts with, 
I think I'm gonna barf. I think I'm gonna barf. I ate three frogs with my hot dogs. I think I'm gonna barf. The song gets even better in the second verse. But Dad put his newspaper right up to his face. That's enough, Will. I left Dad with his stupid newspaper. I've run out of ways to cheer up Mom and Dad. They're hopeless. Day 42. Dear Wenny, I went back to the hospital today. They put a walking cast on my leg. That means I don't have to use my crutches anymore. Day 44. Dear Wenny, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but I've been having this weird problem since I got my walking cast. Remember how you used to hide under my bed and grab my leg when I came into my room? Well, lately I've been having a hard time getting close to my bed. I keep thinking you're going to grab my leg when I walk past. I've had to keep my hockey stick in the corner. That way, I can stand by the door and use the stick to lift the covers and look underneath. You know I'd give anything to see you again. But if you're thinking about visiting me, do me a favor. Don't, and I mean don't, hide under my bed and grab my leg. I'm not kidding. Day 46. Dear Wenny. As soon as we were in my room, Gallagher locked the door. There's something I want to talk about, he said. In private. He pulled a comic out of his bag, the one with the story of Orpheus. Take a look at this. Forget it, I said. It's a stupid story. It is not. It is too. Orpheus is a loser. He could have saved his wife if he hadn't looked back at the last minute. Maybe, said Gallagher. But he was still pretty brave to go down that tunnel into the underworld. It's the tunnel you want to talk about, isn't it? Gallagher's face went red. I've been reading about places in the world that have special connections to the spirit world, he said. Places like haunted houses and old tunnels and stuff. I think the Tunnel of Death in Jackson Park is one of those special places. That's why Mark Johnson saw a ghost in there. That's just some story he made up. Oh yeah? said Gallagher. Well, I want to see for myself. You're crazy to go down the tunnel in winter. The river's too high. There's plenty of room to walk in there, said Gallagher. Dry cement on both sides. I checked. You hoping to see a ghost? I asked. Gallagher shivered. Yeah, maybe, if the tunnel's got the right connections. I sat down on my bed. A year ago, I would have said Gallagher was crazy, but I couldn't say that now because I knew something about tunnels. When I died, the first thing I did was speed through a dark tunnel. What if the tunnel in Jackson Park had special connections like that? What if we really could meet spirits in there? You shouldn't have to go to special places to contact spirits, I said. If you want to see someone badly enough, you should be able to meet them anywhere. Day 47. Wenny. I'd do anything to see you again. So tonight I phoned Gallagher, and we made plans to explore the Tunnel of Death. Maybe we'll see Wenny, said Gallagher. If the tunnel's one of those special spiritual spots, then we should be able to contact real ghosts in there. Wenny's not a ghost. What is she then? An angel. Day 49. Dear Wenny, well, it's Saturday, and I'm grounded, and it's all your fault. It started when Dad called me out to the garage and pointed to the hook on the wall. I hung my life jacket right there after my last fishing trip, he said. It's not here now. I'll help you look, I said. We looked all over the garage, then we went to the backyard and checked out the shed. What did you do with it? he asked. Nothing. And it was true. It was you who did something with it. Remember when you tied Dad's life jacket to the branch above the treehouse? You put it on and had me push you off the edge? I watched you fly. You stuck your arms way out as you swung over Mr. Tibbet's fence. You were flying pretty well till the rope came undone and you crashed into his rose bushes. Or how about the time you tied one end of a rope to Dad's life jacket and the other end to Bullwinkle's collar? And then you shouted, MUSH! and made him pull you on your skates. 
You must have jammed the life jacket in Bullwinkle's kennel after you went skating, because that's where Dad finally found it. Well, guess what? The life jacket was all chewed up and stinky, and Dad's whole face went bright red. So this is the way you treat my stuff, is it? He shook the life jacket hard. What do you have to say for yourself? I didn't do it. Wenny did it. She always steals other people's stuff. She breaks things and doesn't care, and I'm always getting blamed for it. Stop it, Will. I won't stop. It's the truth. When he's bad, she doesn't care about anybody. Dad threw up his arm like he was going to hit me, but he stopped himself. He swore and hurled his life jacket in the rubbish, then sent me to my room for the rest of the day. So here I am, stuck in my room again. I'm still getting in trouble for stuff you did even though you're dead. It's totally unfair. You should be sent to your room up there in heaven. You shouldn't be allowed to play with the other angels for a whole week. I hope you get stuck on a cloud somewhere all alone. I hope you cry yourself to sleep. Day 51. Dear Wenny, Mr. James isn't so bad when you get to know him. Take today, for example. He asked me how things were going, and I said, Lousy. Mr. James put his fingertips together and leaned forward. How come? I got in trouble with Dad. I could feel something on my chest when I said that, like I had a brick in my shirt. What happened? said Mr. James. That's when I told him about the life jacket. I told him how angry I am with you and how much I hate Dad right now. Mr. James didn't even act surprised. He just nodded and said it was okay that I was angry with you. He even said it was okay to be angry with Dad. Can you believe a grown-up would say that? I picked out a colored pencil and doodled on my walking cast. I was trying to get used to the idea that it was okay to be angry. Day 51. Mr. James gave me some paper and pulled the rest of the colored pencils out of his Daffy Duck cup. He sat quiet and just let me draw for a while. The first picture I drew was of a ghoul. He looked sort of like Dad, only his skin was green. He had long, sharp teeth with blood dripping from them. When I finished that, I colored a picture of you swinging out of the treehouse in Dad's life jacket. Mr. James looked at my pictures for a long time. Then he asked why the ghoul had blood on his teeth. I said, I guess he forgot to brush. Next, he held up my picture of you. Whose idea was it to tie the rope to the life jacket? He asked. I told him it was yours, that you'd always wanted to fly. Mr. James looked out the window for a while. He said he liked to fly, too. He flew a glider plane once, and he liked it a lot. He said he wished he could have got to know you better, because you were such a brave girl. That's when I almost told him how fast I flew when I died. Almost. His eyes were really green behind his glasses. He was looking right at me, but I was afraid to tell him. He's probably never been dead before, so he wouldn't understand about that kind of flying. If I told him everything that happened while I was dead, about zooming around in the sky behind you, or about the bad thing that happened with Mom and Dad in the waiting room, he might get all worried and make me move to the crazy kid's ward. So I shut up and let him think you were the only one who likes to fly. Day 54. Dear Wenny, Gallagher came over so we could plan our trip down the tunnel together. We headed for the study to log on to the internet. I've been thinking, said Gallagher. That's a first. <laughs> the thing is, if we want to meet Wenny down there, we've got to let her know when we're going down. How are we going to do that? Gallagher sat in Dad's office chair. We need to have a seance. See if there's a seance website. First, I showed him the cool Greek myth site I found on the web. We read some more about Orpheus. Then we opened the file on Cerberus, the three-headed monster dog. Since you said you saw a monster dog in the tunnel last summer, we thought we should know as much as we could about monster dogs in general. Fact. Cerberus 
is a flesh-eating dog with snakes on his back and a dragon's tail. Fact. He attacks anybody who tries to pass into the underworld. We thought Orpheus was the only guy who ever got past Cerberus, but there was another story on the site about a guy who tricked Cerberus by throwing him a cake full of sleeping potion. Cerberus curled up for a snooze, then the guy sneaked past him. Gallagher printed out the whole Cerberus section. Then we found another site and printed some pages about seances. So get ready. Day 55. Dear Winnie, remember Julie? She still comes over to babysit, even though I'm 11 and can take care of myself. The good thing about Julie is that you can count on her to fall asleep in front of the TV. We had a lot of work to do, but we had to make out it was a typical overnight so Julie wouldn't get suspicious. Gallagher started out the evening by chasing me around the house with a vacuum cleaner and sucking up my t-shirt. I was just about to get my revenge by dumping liquid soap on his head, when Julie pulled the vacuum cleaner's plug and made us eat the macaroni cheese she'd made. After dinner, Julie went to Mom's room to call one of her girlfriends. As soon as she was out of the way, I got down a can of dog food. We thought we'd put something together for the monster dog down our tunnel. We didn't have any cakes or sleeping potion, but we had some dog food and some herb tea in the cupboard. Gallagher opened the can. I tore open the box of sweet sleep tea. Bullwinkle came into the kitchen and got all excited, thinking I was going to feed him for the second time in one day. He drooled all over my walking cast. Cool it, I said. I tore open the sweet sleep tea bags, and Gallagher spooned the green powder into the dog food can. Bullwinkle was doing a happy dance in the middle of the kitchen. This isn't for you, I said. But Bullwinkle didn't believe me. While Gallagher mashed the green stuff into the dog food, I read the words on the tea box. Sweet sleep tea combines powerful natural herbs so you can enjoy a deep, restful sleep. It'd better work on the monster dog, said Gallagher. We headed back to my room, and I drew a map for you. At 9.30, we sneaked to the living room to check on Julie. She was in front of the TV, snoring so hard, her nose ring was flapping up and down. Let's get started, whispered Gallagher. I headed for the kitchen. When I got back to my room, Gallagher had the window open and the wind was blowing the curtains all over the place. Shut that, I said. When he needs a way to get in, said Gallagher. I shook the tablecloth over the card table. No, she doesn't. Doors and walls don't matter to angels. How do you know, said Gallagher. He was jamming candles into the holders. I just know. How? I didn't feel like talking about going through the hospital walls when I was dead. I still hadn't told Gallagher all that stuff. Leave it open if you want, I said. I put a plate of cookies on the table and we both tried them. Pretty good. Gallagher lit the candles and flicked off the lights. We sat across from each other at the card table. The wind was blowing the candle flames back and forth and the branches of the maple tree were scratching the side of the house. Spooky, said Gallagher. I could see by his face he was scared, but I was looking forward to it. I wanted to see the bright light again and feel that good warm feeling. Gallagher put out his hands. We've got to hold hands. No, we don't. Yes, we do, said Gallagher. It sets up the psychic energy system. I took his hands and... Gallagher closed his eyes. Winnie, he moaned. If you can hear us, knock on the table three times. She won't do that, I said. Why not? She never does what she's told. She's more likely to kick your shin. How am I supposed to call her then? I don't know. She never comes when she's called. Gallagher ate another cookie. I did too. Just a minute. I grabbed Super Bee Man and Dr. Death from my shelf and put them on the table. The warriors looked pretty cool in the candlelight. Okay, I said. Now she's got cookies to eat and a couple of warriors to play with. She always liked playing with my stuff. We took hands. Wenny, moaned Gallagher. 
Come out from the spirit world. Wenny, I said. I've got some snickerdoodles here, and I'll eat them all unless you come and get some. The room was quiet except for the wind, which was singing a sad kind of song. You can't play with Super Bee Man, I said, because he's mine, and because you're a girl. The candle flames were doing a jig. We've got a map of the Tunnel of Death, said Gallagher. It'll show you where to meet us tomorrow, so you'd better pay close attention, and... She doesn't like to be told what to do, I said. Oh, shut up, said Gallagher. I feel something. The wind was howling all around the room. All of a sudden, the candles went out, and everything was black. Stop it, yelled Gallagher. Don't touch me! I heard a big noise across the table. I couldn't see Gallagher in the dark. What is it? I called. What's going on? Get away from me! Screamed Gallagher. Leave me alone! I tried to reach Gallagher, but the table flipped over and crashed to the floor. Then I heard a weird smacking sound. Help! Shouted Gallagher. My heart felt like a punch bag. Show yourself! I said. Come on, Wenny! Then flick! The light went on. What the heck are you guys doing? yelled Julie, her orange hair standing straight up. Bullwinkle trotted around the room, looking pleased with himself. Julie snatched the candles off the rug. You idiots could have started a fire. What are you up to? Just messing around, I said. Well, knock it off and clean up this mess, she said, and swept out of the room. Day 55. Gallagher's eyes were as round as fishbowls. When he touched me, he said. He ran his hands down his trousers like there were spider's webs all over them. Where? On my knee. Gallagher's hands were shaking, so he shoved them into his pockets. She was under the table. I sat down. When he used to hide under my bed and grab my leg when I passed by just to bug me. Bullwinkle's tongue was hanging out and drool was dripping. I picked up the card table and found Super Bee Man and Dr. Death. The cookies were gone. I looked all over. Gallagher helped too. Wenny, whispered Gallagher. I told you she liked cookies, I said. P.S. It's been a couple of hours since the seance. Gallagher's snoring in his sleeping bag, so I'm finishing this letter under my covers with a torch. Around 10.30, Bullwinkle barfed up the cookies. Okay, so you didn't eat the cookies. That doesn't mean you didn't come and visit us. I hope you looked over the map. Maps can be hard for a seven-year-old, so if you're not sure where to meet us in the tunnel tomorrow, ask an older angel for directions. Day 56. Dear Wenny, Birch Creek gets pretty full in winter in Jackson Park, but there was dry space on either side of the water when I peeked inside the tunnel. Behind me, Gallagher emptied out his pack and spread our stuff on the ground. A tape player, the can of dog food, a chain, and the map. Bullwinkle drooled all over the dog food. Get out of here, said Gallagher. He shone our torch across his black furry back. Maybe we shouldn't have brought him. Bullwinkle wagged his tail and stepped on the tape player. Get off! shouted Gallagher. He pushed Bullwinkle's rump. Bullwinkle turned and licked his cheek. I flicked on the tape player so we could hear the lullaby. The lady sang, Sleep, baby, sleep. Those songs you picked had better work, said Gallagher. I rewound the tape. They're not as good as Orpheus could play, but the label said the songs are soothing. To babies, maybe, said Gallagher. If the songs don't work on a monster dog, we can feed him the sweet sleep dog food potion, I said. Gallagher picked up the tape player. I could see his hand shaking. 
I grabbed the torch, and we stepped inside. We didn't need the torch right away, because the good, gray outside light was shining in from the opening. The color went from soft, gray-white to dark gray as we made our way along. Bullwinkle panted behind me. I could feel his warm breath on my hand. I was glad to feel it there. We took the first turn, and I flicked on the light. The cold air got colder. The sound of rushing water on our left got louder, too, like the river was yelling. The ceiling came down from 12 feet to about 8 feet. We rounded the second corner. I shined the torch on the rushing river. The light jumped all around in the black water. We were pretty close to the place where the monster dog was hiding last summer. Gallagher stopped and pointed to a lump on the floor ahead of us. I froze. I was hoping it wasn't the monster dog. I turned the torch on it. It turned out to be a big brown grocery bag with the words Mel's Market printed on the side. A gnawed bone was sticking out of a tear in the bottom of the bag. Next to the bag was a beer bottle and a couple of empty bean cans. A bad stink was coming from the bag. Behind me, Bullwinkle was pushing against my butt. He wanted that bone. I held him back and kept the circle of light on the bag. Then, the bag started to move. My heart banged inside my chest. Ghost, whispered Gallagher. I put my hand down between my legs to stop from peeing my pants. Gallagher swayed, then leaned against the wall like he was going to fall over. Bullwinkle started growling. Shh, I said. The bag inched closer. Barf came up my throat. I swallowed it down. All of a sudden, Bullwinkle howled and blew past me in a crazy rush for the bag. Get away from there, you stupid dog! A huge rat leaped out of the bag. Bullwinkle snarled. The hair on his back went straight up. He leaped past the sack and chased the rat down the tunnel, barking his head off. The rat squealed, plunged into the river, and was swept around the next corner. Jeez, said Gallagher. No kidding, I said. Bullwinkle trotted back to the bag, all happy now. He tore the bag open to lick the bone. Then he stood on the bag, wagging his tail. You stupid mutt, I said, and Gallagher and I stumbled over to give him some dog hugs. Monster Slayer, said Gallagher. Bullwinkle's the bravest dog ever. He sure is. It took a while for us to get up the nerve to keep walking down the tunnel. But I still wanted to meet you. We're in almost as deep as Mark Johnson went, Gallagher said, in a shaky voice, after we came to the fourth turn. He saw the ghosts somewhere around here. Gallagher walked on, really slowly now. Don't worry, I said. But I was just saying those words. The air was thick and cold and sour. Old, dead air with no good smells in it. I was having the worst kind of feeling. When we reached the fifth turn, Gallagher stopped. Hear that? I listened above the sound of the tumbling river. A low growling. My knees got all soft. Behind me, Bullwinkle dropped his bone. He started to growl back. Monster dog, said Gallagher. Use the music, I whispered. Gallagher turned on the tape player. Sleep, baby sleep, sang the lady. He put the tape player on the floor and pulled the dog food out of his pack. Then he took out the chain. Moonlight shining on the sea, sang the lady. Baby's little boat is rocking, rocking her to sleep. Bullwinkle butted me hard, trying to get past. Stop it, I warned. The growling up ahead got louder. I could feel Bullwinkle tensing behind me. I grabbed his collar. He growled back. Cut it out, I whispered. That's when Bullwinkle went ballistic. <laughs> He tore away from my grip and knocked me down as he raced past. The torch flew out of my hand, hit the floor, and went out. The torch! screamed Gallagher. Grab it! Turn it on! In the dark ahead, we heard snarling and barking. Gallagher stepped back and fell over me. Get off! I yelled. The sound of the wild dogfight echoed all around. The black walls bouncing with snapping teeth and yelping. 
mixed in with the snarls and yelps? The lady sang, Morning will come shining. Run! shouted Gallagher. I jumped up, turned around, tried to run, but I couldn't see. I was moving in the dark, the dogfight all around me, walls barking, snarling water. Bullwinkle! I screamed. The monster dog will kill him! Go! yelled Gallagher. I felt the slimy wall and tried to run. Gallagher rammed into me. I fell down hard and rolled into the river. Freezing black water swept me back towards the dogfight. I thrashed the water, feeling my legs sinking. The cast! I couldn't swim in that stupid cast. Help! Where are you? screamed Gallagher. I tried to paddle. My feet sank again and found the bottom. I stood up. The water was pushing against my thighs. I pushed back, walking against it. Gallagher! Over here! Keep yelling so I can find you! North! screamed Gallagher over the snarls and barks and lullaby sung. You can make it! Come this way! I followed Gallagher's voice till I felt a wet hand. Gallagher hauled me out of the river. Bullwinkle! I cried. We have to go back for him. He's defending us, said Gallagher, so we can get out. He pulled me down the tunnel, the dogs fighting far behind us. Then I heard a big splash. The barking and growling stopped. The only sound I could hear above the river was the lady on the tape way down the tunnel singing, Night, night, baby, time for sleep. Day 56, later. Dear Winnie, it took us a long time, but we made it back home. After we tied a towel around Bullwinkle's bloody shoulder, I hid in the bathroom and blew hot air on my cast with Mom's hairdryer. But it didn't work. The cast was too soggy from falling in the river. Pretty soon, Mom wanted to know what I was doing. Then Dad came in all upset, calling, What happened to Bullwinkle? I told them we'd been down to the tunnel by Jackson Park, and Bullwinkle got into a fight with a mean dog. Dad got on the phone with the vet. Then he called the council. P.S. The council called Dad back while I was at the hospital getting a new cast. They found a stray dog in the tunnel, an abandoned Rottweiler that had gone wild. They said it was a dangerous dog and thanked Dad for calling him. The dog had a sore hind leg from getting into a fight. I was proud of Bullwinkle for that. They also said they found a tape player in the tunnel. They asked if it belonged to us. Day 59. Dear Winnie, you're the only person I can tell this to, so I hope you're listening. Mom and Dad made a special home appointment with Mr. James. He walked right into my room this afternoon and sat down on my bed. I stayed at my desk and got really busy, looking at Igor doing nothing. Do you want to go outside, Will? Mr. James asked. There were some white clouds in the sky, but the sun was mostly shining. I said okay, so we went to the backyard. One good thing about California is that you can still play outside in December, if it's not raining. I showed Mr. James Bullwinkle's house. Bullwinkle was inside. He licked Mr. James's hand. Mr. James and I sat in the lawn chairs under the treehouse. Our treehouse has been so lonely, Winnie, with nobody to go up there anymore. I didn't want to look at it. The wind was blowing the maple branches around, making the sunlight skitter across Mr. James's glasses. He asked how I was doing. I said, fine. That's what grown-ups always say. Fine. I'm doing fine. I flashed him a big smile. I figured if I said I was fine and smiled really big, he'd go away. Mom came out with a cup of tea for Mr. James. There was a lemon wedge and two sugar cubes on the saucer. Remember the time I caught you under my bed with a whole box of sugar cubes? You taught me how to put a sugar cube in my mouth, count to three really fast, then put it back in the box so it didn't look sucked on? Well, Mom still uses that sugar when company comes over. I noticed the sugar cubes on Mr. James's plate had kind of round corners. Mom went off to the shops and left us alone for a while. I was waiting for him to ask me another question like he always does, but I was surprised by the one he asked. Have you had a chance to write in the book I gave you? I write to Wenny, I said. Stupid me, I couldn't believe I told him that. I'm glad. Whoa, 
I almost fell out of my chair when he said that. I didn't know what to do next, so I looked up at our treehouse for a long time. Do you miss your treehouse, Will? I nodded yes. It was like Mr. James had Superman glasses so he could look right into my head. He knelt down in front of me. How strong are you? Strong? Wrap your arms around me, but don't squeeze my neck. I wrapped my arms around him. He stood up and walked back and forth with me hanging down his back. I must have been heavy with my cast on and all. You holding tight? Tight, I said. And he started to climb. Hand over hand, he climbed our treehouse ladder all the way to the top. Then he put me down in my favorite spot and let me look out. We sat there together, letting the world be small under us. Twinkie trotted across the yard, her white fur blowing this way and that. The wind was cold, but I didn't mind, because I felt like I could breathe up here. There's twice as much air in the treehouse as there is in our house right now. Treehouse air is like heaven air. I breathed in all I could. Twinkie climbed the tree. She curled up in my lap and purred. I touched her side and felt the vibration. She's wanted me up in the treehouse for so long. Mr. James crossed his legs. I wrote lots of letters to my dad after he died, he said. No fooling? No fooling. It helped me a lot. He took off his glasses and cleaned them on his white shirt. I think it helped my dad, too. How do you know it helped your dad? He shook his head. Just a feeling I got. He put his glasses back on, looked right into my face, and smiled. And I knew he wasn't lying. He didn't have to say anything else. Now the clouds were back on his glasses, and there was light shining from his eyes. Twinkie got up and did a slow circle dance in my lap. Then she settled herself down in the crook of my knee for a nap. Did you know I died when I was in the hospital? Your mom and dad told me. They know my heart stopped for a while, I said. But they don't know what I saw when I was dead. What did you see? A dark tunnel that turned into a sky full of light. There was a light person ahead of us. Wenny and I flew towards him, but I stopped because I was thinking about Mom and Dad. Anyway, I, I whooshed back down to the inside of the hospital. The doctors used heart shock paddles on my chest, and I was sucked back into my body. I licked my lips. My heart was thudding like I'd run 500 miles. It's called a near-death experience, Will. What? What you had. Other people have had that happen to them. They remember things they saw when they died. Most of them talk about seeing a bright light. Do they say the light's warm? Some do. And they talk about feeling full of love. That's it, I said. Sometimes they see people of light, he said. Sometimes they see relatives who have died. Like I saw Wenny? Yeah, like that. So you don't think I'm crazy? No, you're lucky. You're one of the few people who've died and come back. Twinkie must have liked what Mr. James was saying because she left my lap to curl up in his. Mr. James petted her fur really nicely and she gave him a purr. Have you told your mom and dad what happened? I can't, I said. Mr. James scratched behind Twinkie's ear. I was afraid to tell Mom and Dad the whole story. I was worried if I told them the good part, I'd end up telling them the bad part, too. Your Mom and Dad are hurting really badly right now, Will. But you'll find the right time to tell them. How will I know when it's right? You'll know, said Mr. James. Just keep writing to Winnie, he said. And you'll find a way. So that's the story. All of it. I breathed some good air. I told our secret to one real person, and he believes in you. Day 81. Dear Wenny, I know I haven't written to you in a while, but ever since I got my cast off, it's been hard work just to walk again. My leg is stiff and sore most of the time. 
And nothing much else has happened except for Christmas, and that was a disaster. Things are pretty much the same at home, which means they're bad. Dad hardly ever talks to Mom or me. At night, he works down in his studio. Mom's belly is bigger, and her baby will come out sometime in March, your birthday month. The only other thing I have to tell you is that our picture is missing from the living room wall. You know the photograph Dad took of us walking away from him down the path? I always liked the way Dad painted color onto that black and white photograph. He painted your dress blue, my shirt green, and the sunshine bright white. He made the roses your favorite color pink. He's painted lots of black and white photos of us, but that one was the best. I don't know why he took it off the wall. Winnie, I don't think I ever told you how happy Mom and Dad acted when Mom was pregnant with you. I was only three, but I remember how Dad used to sit really close to Mom on the couch and put his ear on her belly to hear you. Dad also liked to turn the music way up. He'd read a book that said babies can hear music in the womb. Well, Mom's belly's getting pretty big, but Dad hasn't put his ear to her stomach once. Also, he hasn't been playing any music, so the baby hasn't had a chance to dance inside Mom's womb the way you did. So here's my plan. I know Mom and Dad keep the box of old baby toys on the shelf in your cupboard. I'll get the stuff down. Maybe I can get Mom and Dad talking about how fun the baby's gonna be. Maybe Mom will smile. Maybe Dad will put on some music. What do you think? Day 89, again. Dear Wenny, I went ahead with my plan right after dinner. Mom was sitting on the couch having tea, and Dad was reading the paper, so I put on some nice music. I turned it up pretty loud. What are you doing? said Dad. Making it loud so the baby can hear. Dad put the paper in his lap. Who gave you that idea? You did, I said. You did it the last time Mom was pregnant. Well, turn it down, said Dad, and he started reading the paper again. I should have taken the hint, but I can be as dumb as Bullwinkle sometimes. Next, I set the busy box on the couch next to Mom. The baby can have this, I said, even though it used to be mine. Thanks, Will, said Mom. I got a couple of rattles and pop beads and put them on Mom's lap. Then I pulled out Milton. You should sew up his torn spot, I said. Dad looked across the room. I wanted him to come and check out the toys. I wanted him to pat Mom's belly in time to the music, but he got out of his chair and left the house. Mom put Milton up to her cheek to hide her tears. So much for cheering them up. Day 98. Dear Winnie, It's been a week since I got out the baby toys. I think it gave Mom some ideas, because today I heard noises coming from your room. It scared me. I don't know why, like you were in there or something. I tiptoed down the hall and peeked in. Mom was wearing one of Dad's old gardening shirts, and her hair was tied back with a red bandana. She stood by your window, shaking out your quilt. Help me fold this, she said. We folded your purple quilt. Then Mom tore the blankets and sheets off your bed and tossed them in the hamper. It's just like normal, I told myself. Just like any old laundry day. But it wasn't. Your bed was empty. Mom put her hands on her hips and looked around. Then she left the room. I didn't look at your bed the whole time she was gone. She came back in with four boxes. She grabbed a red crayon and wrote on the boxes, clothes, stuffed animals and dolls, toys, books. I'm going to try to get through these without crying, she said. I know the baby needs a room, and when he... Her lips started to quiver. She crossed her arms and looked out of the window at the old plum tree. Will you help me? My hands got sweaty. You're not going to give Wenny stuff away. Mom picked up your heart-shaped sunglasses. We'll keep all her things safe in a box, she said. Okay, I'll help, I said. It felt weird to be working with Mom in your room without you jumping on your bed singing gooey gobs of alligator jam or 
showing me the place you like to hide your tooth for the tooth fairy? I took the toys box over to your shelf to pack the girl stuff. First, I packed the magic loom. On top of that, I stacked a bunch of little ponies. Next to the ponies, I laid the trolls with yellow, blue, and green hair. At the back of the top shelf, I found all the baseball cards I've been missing and some of the coins from my coin collection. Some of this stuff is mine, I said. I'll take whatever you want, said Mom. I started a pile of my things by the door. Back at the shelf, I found all your gumball rings rolling around in a shoebox with some marbles and a gob of silly putty. I was stuffing the rings in my pocket when I saw some red plastic sticking out from under the shelf. My horseshoe magnet. You tried to hide it from me. My heart thumped when I pulled it out. But when I turned around, I saw Mom was just sitting on your empty bed. What is it? I said. Right away, I was sorry I'd asked, because she looked down at her hands. There was the round glass ball with the ballerina inside, the one Mom and Dad got for you on our last holiday. Mom jiggled it. The ballerina twirled around and around. Snow came down. Mom started crying. Her shoulders shook and her hands went all soft. I had to catch the ballerina before it landed on the floor. After a while, we left your room and shut the door. I don't think we can ever go back in there again. Day 99. Dear Wenny, Gallagher got a hold of his sister's extravaganza magazine today. He read some of it over the phone. The last article he read was called World Will End. It said all the major psychics have predicted the world will be coming to an end at 6 o'clock on the 9th of March. I had to hang up before Gallagher could tell me how the world would end because Dad was in the kitchen getting angry at Mom. I could hear Dad yelling. He found out that we'd gone into your room to pack up some stuff. Mom said we were just packing things up to make room for the baby. That's when Dad flipped out. He stomped downstairs to his studio. At 6 o'clock, Mom sent me down to call Dad for dinner. I stood outside the door for a while, reading the keep out sign that's written in German. I knocked. Dad, dinner's ready. He didn't answer. I thought maybe he was in the dark room with the door closed. Dad, dinner. I'm busy, called Dad. Mom made burgers. Start without me. I put my finger on the wooden sign and traced the German words for keep out. Eintritt verboten. Back in the kitchen, Mom asked when Dad was coming up. Later, I said. We ate our burgers by ourselves. I don't care how the world's gonna end. I'm just glad it's going to. Day 99. Later. Dear Wenny, it's about one o'clock in the morning. Mom and Dad had another fight. I was asleep, but all that yelling and crying woke me. I'm in the cupboard with Twinkie now. I have a torch so I can write to you. I have to tell you about the fight. It's bad this time, Wenny. Worse than it's ever been. I heard all the noise, so I got out of bed and sneaked into the hall and hid behind the door. I peeked into the living room. Dad was in his chair, leaning over with his elbows on his knees. He was squeezing his hands so hard, his knuckles were turning white. What do you mean I'm never here? He yelled. You're either at work or in that stupid dark room. That stupid dark room helps pay the bills. But you're in there all the time, Charlie. You won't talk to Will or to me. Dad jumped up. He crossed his arms and looked out the window at the rain pounding on the pavement. I'm doing the best I can, he said. Well, I need more. Will needs more. I don't know what you're asking. Mom stood up. I'm asking you to come back from wherever you are. Dad turned around. I never left, he shouted. His voice was so loud it made me jump. Mom's face went white. Don't shout, said Mom. You'll wake up Will. If I'm not good enough for you, Kate, just say so. That's not what I'm saying. Listen to me, Charlie. I need you to start living here again. I want you to promise you're going to protect us, and you're going to love this new baby when it comes. Dad paced back and forth in front of the window. How can I promise to protect you when we both know how crazy and dangerous it is out there? He waved his arms above his head. 
There are murderers and poison Halloween sweets and drugs. Kids get hurt and we can't do anything to protect them. Nothing. Day 99. Say it, said Mom. She touched the place in the wall where our picture used to be. Say your daughter's name, Charlie. You haven't been able to say her name since the funeral. Say Wenny. That's when Dad let out this big roar, like his mouth was a cave with this wild animal trapped inside. Mom gripped the mantle. I scrunched down in the corner. Dad ran out of the house, slammed the car door, and drove off down the street. I could hear his tires screeching from all the way inside the house. I waited a long time behind the door, then I went in and sat next to Mom. She put her head on my shoulder like I was the dad and she was the kid. I touched her belly. It was so big with that baby. Why is Dad so angry with you? I asked. He's not angry with me, honey. He's angry with himself. Mom ran her fingers through my hair. He blames himself for what happened to you and Winnie. It wasn't his fault. I know, Will, but he doesn't know that. The rain pounded on the window. I could hear my own heartbeat in my ears. Mom? Yeah? We were on the zebra crossing. I know. I ran and Wenny ran too, but I ran faster than she did. You were older and you could run faster. I screamed for her to run, Mom, but the truck came so fast. I know. Then I was crying on her shoulder, and Mom held me close for a long time. Day 105. Dear Wenny, I wish Dad weren't so angry about us packing up your room. It's not a fun job, but the baby's gonna need a place to sleep. It will still be your room, too. I promise. Day 107. Dear Wenny, we've been painting your room. It turns out to be a lot of work. Mom let me pick the colors. First, we painted the walls and ceiling all light blue. Then I told Mom my plan to paint white clouds on top of the blue. At first, Mom didn't like the idea, but she gave in after I told her I'd share my stash of Snickers bars with her. I'm about halfway through with the clouds now. I'm using a sponge to paint them on. The clouds look okay, but not as good as they looked when I was dead for a while. I painted a hole in the clouds with white light coming through. It wasn't as bright as I wanted it to be. You can't find that kind of brightness at Hal's Hardware Store. Day 120. Dear Wenny, You should know that Mom and Dad are seeing a counselor at the Family Counseling Center. Mom says Dad's been working through his grief issues. And things will be different. Things will be better. I hope he hurries up with his grief issues because I miss him. I was missing Dad so much today that I did something I shouldn't have done. I stole the key and sneaked downstairs to his studio. You know all those black and white pictures he's taken of us over the years? The ones he painted on so they looked really old? Well, he's got all those pictures framed and stored in neat boxes. They're good. The picture on top was the one of you and me walking down the path. You know, the one Dad took off the living room wall? After I checked out the rest of the box, I looked at the black and whites he's been working on now. That's when I figured out why Dad's been locking the door. He hasn't wanted Mom and me to see. Dad's been painting on some black and white pictures of us, Wenny, but they're not the good shots. These pictures are what Dad used to call throwaways. The first one was of you and me in the sand pit. You were probably three. We were supposed to be doing a nice sandcastle photo, only you got bored and poured your glass of lemonade over my head. We had to stop so Dad could drag me into the bathroom and wash the sticky stuff out of my hair. I remember how angry Dad was. He scrubbed my head so hard, I thought my scalp was gonna rip right off. The thing I didn't know 
was that Dad got a picture of you pouring the lemonade over my head. The second shot was of you stomping on a party hat with your dress shoe. The third picture really got to me. It was taken on the day we walked down the path together. Right after he got the good photo that used to hang on the living room wall, you raced on ahead of me. I turned around and looked at Dad, and he took the shot. It's a strange looking photo. There I am looking at Dad, and way up ahead of us on the path, you're running into the sunlight with your arms spread apart like you're going to take off. I don't know why Dad wanted to paint on that picture, but he hasn't finished it yet. I'm still black and white, but Dad painted your dress blue, your curly hair blonde, and your spread out arms light pink. He painted red roses on the sides of the path, and he painted the gold sunlight you're running into. Day 140. Dear Winnie, it's been a while since I've written, but I've been hanging around at Gallagher's house a lot. I went again after school today. We had a snack of crackers, apples smeared with peanut butter, and chocolate milk. Have you ever filled your mouth with crackers and tried to whistle? Gallagher and I had a contest. We couldn't stop laughing. You should get some of the angels together and try it sometime. It's a riot. I don't think God would mind. He must like a good laugh every once in a while. Otherwise, you wouldn't have come up with things like baboons and walruses. March will be here soon, and Gallagher and I made some important plans together. I can't tell you our plans right now because they're secret. You'll just have to wait and see. The 2nd of March, day 147. Surprise, Wenny! I bet you didn't think you'd be getting any presents this year. Well, I wouldn't forget something as important as your birthday. I sent you a card, but I thought I'd write this letter too and tell you all the stuff we did. First of all, Gallagher and I headed for the woods with all your presents. Bullwinkle ran ahead to sniff out the trail. We must have looked pretty stupid hiking through the trees with a bunch of helium balloons tied to our belts. But nobody saw us, so that's okay. It ended up taking us more than two hours to find the meadow Gallagher was looking for. Even though my cast has been off for more than two months, my legs started to get sore from all that walking. By three o'clock, I was ready to kill Gallagher, because I thought we were lost, but we finally made it to the meadow, and so we got all happy again. Bullwinkle ran around in circles while we got out your party stuff, we didn't have a cake, but we brought six chocolate marshmallow bars, and they were pretty good. After Gallagher chomped his third marshmallow bar, he licked his teeth and said, Time for presents! I fished in the bag for the new red gumball ring I've been saving in my box. I tied it on a yellow balloon with the rest of your gumball rings. The rings are pretty light because they're plastic. All your presents had to be light this year because helium balloons can't carry much. Next, we tied Bullwinkle's present onto the pink and green balloons. He thought you'd like Twinkie's kitty snake. Twinkie didn't want it anymore with all the catnip shaken out of it, but Bullwinkle's been pretty attached to it, so I hope you tell him thank you. Next, we sent off Gallagher's present. He's pretty proud of that photograph of himself blowing the big bubble. Did you know it takes six pieces of bubblegum to make a bubble that huge? We didn't sing Happy Birthday but I taught Gallagher how to sing your made-up song, Alligator Jam. He liked the part that goes, Squish the jam between your toes, Stick the jam up your nose. I tied the last present on four red balloons, because my magnet is pretty heavy. I sent the card, too. I hope you like my picture of the light person. Day 147, still. Dear Wenny, we never should have trusted Bullwinkle. He's got the brains of a mosquito. The sun was already setting when we left the meadow, so we knew we had to hurry. After walking through the woods for a while, Bullwinkle ran down another trail. Then he came back, barking his head off. I think he's found a shortcut, said Gallagher. So I think we should follow him.
No way, I said. No shortcuts. If we don't, we'll be walking home in the dark, said Gallagher. We should cut across the woods like Bullwinkle says. Did Bullwinkle say all that? No. He just found a shortcut. Come on. Like two totally deranged dumbheads, we followed Bullwinkle. He took us on a smaller trail. It's what Gallagher calls a deer trail because animals make it instead of people. Gallagher said deer trails are good because animals know where they're going. When the trail got steep, Gallagher said that was a good sign. We'd get out of the hills faster and down into the flat part of the forest that leads into town. That was before the deer trail jerked around and started going uphill again. Day 147. Still. Dear Winnie, well, we started following Bullwinkle around 5.30. Now it's 7.30. Gallagher's down at the stream getting us some water. I'm sitting here in the moonlight, freezing my butt off while I write this letter. Once we realized the deer trail was a stupid plan, we got to work searching for the people trail again. That was an hour ago. We've walked through tons of underbrush in the moonlight. The deer trail doesn't connect up to the people trail anywhere we can find. Bottom line, someone's going to have to come after us if we're going to get out of here tonight because we're L-O-S-T lost. The only one who's happy is Bullwinkle, and that's because he's too stupid to be scared. We don't have a torch or sleeping bags or normal overnight stuff. But Gallagher says he knows all about survival in the woods because he's a scout. He brought a half box of crackers and a funny kind of tube with peanut butter inside it. You squeeze the peanut butter out just like toothpaste. I know you hate peanut butter, Winnie, but it tastes pretty darn good when you're stuck in the middle of nowhere at dinner time. I'm glad we brought our coats. I'm glad Bullwinkle is curled up next to me. His breath is warm on my hand. Gallagher's coming back with the water now, so I've got to stop writing. Watch over us tonight, Winnie. I think we'll need it. Day 147. Again. Dear Wenny, I was glad we had a full moon. Or the forest would have been completely dark. The stars are nice to look at, but they don't give off any more light than a bunch of fireflies. I've never been so cold. I've been worried about frostbite, but Gallagher said I should just keep wiggling my toes inside my shoes. I've been doing that, but it doesn't help much. Bullwinkle may be stupid. He may have got us lost, but it's hard to be angry with him because he's been doing a good job keeping us warm. Gallagher and I have been taking turns lying next to Bullwinkle. We've been covering ourselves with redwood branches. It's kind of like sleeping with a porcupine blanket. When I get a little bit warmed up, Gallagher lies down in the middle and we fix up the branches again. We've been switching places all night, which means I've hardly got any sleep. The only one who's been sleeping much is Bullwinkle. Not only that, he doesn't seem to be cold at all. A fur coat is better than skin, I've decided. God should have made us that way so we wouldn't have to get so cold when we're outside. I think you should talk to him about it next time you see him. Well, I'm gonna curl up beside Gallagher some more. I can't sleep, but I can't write anymore either. My hands are too cold outside my coat sleeves. My teeth are starting to chatter. I want this night to be over right now. Day 148. Dear Winnie, it was Dad who found us. He must have a talent for finding people because lots of people were searching for us in the wrong places all night long. Even the police. Dad spent most of the night checking everywhere he could think of in town. Then he decided to try the woods. He reached the trail at about five in the morning. Clouds rolled in and it had started to rain. Dad walked and shouted and walked and shouted. As soon as we heard him, we shouted back and started running. Dad raced through the mud and picked me up and held me tight. I thought I'd lost you, he cried. Even though it was raining and the wind was blowing hard, I felt Dad's arms around me. He didn't let me go for a long time. His big arms sent warmth through my whole body. Before we headed back, Dad used his mobile phone to call off the search. 
He told everybody he was taking us back to our house. When we walked through the front door, Mom and Gallagher's family were there waiting with a policeman. Everybody hugged and cried. Gallagher's mom told us we were wet and cold, which we already knew. Mom said we were hungry, and we knew that, too. But pretty soon we were wrapped in blankets. We sat on the couch, chomping down scrambled eggs and stacks of toast with butter and strawberry jam. The policeman sat across from us in Dad's big chair. I just need to ask you boys a few questions, he said. What were you doing in the woods? I finished my glass of orange juice. Walking, I said. We got lost, said Gallagher. Duh, I said. What time did you head out yesterday? Asked the cop. About one o'clock, I said. Gallagher jammed a hunk of toast in his mouth. We had a lot of stuff to get together before we could go. Hiking gear? Asked the cop. Birthday party stuff, said Gallagher. I poked him. The cop leaned forward. Which one of you is having a birthday? He asked. Neither one of us, said Gallagher. It was Wenny's birthday. Dad sucked in his breath. I wanted to strangle Gallagher. Wenny, said the cop. He wrote it down on his clipboard. Was there another kid with you out there? I thought only you two boys were missing. It was just us, I said. Then who's Winnie? Dad left the room. I could hear the water running in the kitchen. Mom sat down next to me on the couch. Winnie was our daughter, she said. She died in October. Day 148, again. Dear Winnie, after everybody left, I started to notice a stink. I sniffed my clothes and decided it was me. That's what I get for sleeping next to Bullwinkle. Remember Mr. Big Bubble? I poured a whole cup into the bath. That bath felt so good. It smelled good, too. I stayed inside a mountain of bubbles till I was warm all the way into my bones. Then I dressed and went down the hall. Mom and Dad were standing by the kitchen sink. They were hugging. They didn't see me because I was outside the door. Dad was saying, Sorry, Kate. Mom was touching Dad's cheek where it was rough from not shaving. I sneaked back down the hall and lay down on my bed. I hadn't seen them hug like that for a long time. I didn't want to get in their way. Day 152. Dear Wenny, This afternoon, I climbed up to our treehouse. I hadn't been up there since Mr. James carried me up the ladder. The floor of the treehouse was a mess. Dead leaves were everywhere, like soggy cornflakes, so I took the broom up and started to sweep. I was working up a sweat by the time Dad came outside. Hey, Dad. What are you going to do with those leaves? He asked. Dump them over the edge? Wait, said Dad. He went into the house and came back with a dustpan and bin bag sack. He climbed right up to the treehouse. My skin got prickly just having him up there with me. He hasn't been in the treehouse since our water balloon fight last summer. Dad started shoveling leaves into the bin bag. I kept sweeping. The broom uncovered a piece of red rubber. Dad picked up the balloon skin. This one hit me in the face, he said. When he was a good shot, I said. Dad rubbed the balloon with his thumb. She was good at lots of things, he said. His head was bent down so I could see the gray hairs on his head. She could make you laugh, I said. Dad wiped some dirt from his hands. I kept talking. It wasn't your fault. The branch above us creaked in the wind. Dad looked up at me. I shouldn't have let you go to town. Why not? We walked to the craft store lots of times before. I shouldn't have let you go. Day 152. Dear Wenny. 
Dad stood up and leaned against the banister. I stepped up next to him. He was breathing hard. Some wind came along and blew the leaves off the top of our pile. It's been almost five months, said Dad. It's been 152 days, I said. You've been counting? I've been counting. Dad put his arm around me. We looked out over the neighborhood rooftops. Things will never be the same, he said. I know. We watched the wind blow thick clouds across the whole sky, but the sun broke through in some places. Day 153. Dear Wenny, the world is supposed to end on the 9th of March. Lots of important psychics have predicted it. Since today is the 8th of March, Gallagher brought his sister's extravaganza magazine to school today and showed everyone the world will end headline. He scared most of the kids on the playground. One kid peed his pants. When Mrs. Terwilliger found out, she locked the extravaganza magazine in her desk and made Gallagher sit in the corner. 9th of March, day 154. Psychics say the world ends today. Dear Winnie, when I got home from Gallagher's house this afternoon, Mom was putting a new cot together in your room. There were big empty cardboard boxes on your floor with crib parts sticking out of them. Mom was on her hands and knees, reading a page of instructions. One of your shelves is full of baby toys and stacks of clean nappies. The other shelf has your stuff on it. It made me feel good to see some of your things back in your room. Mom put Milton Bear on the top shelf next to the catapult you made. You did a good job because it still works. I went to my room and took the ballerina out of my cupboard. I've been keeping her safe for you. I put her on your top shelf next to Milton. Mom looked up. I couldn't tell if the ballerina made her happy or sad because she had a screw sticking out of her mouth. Come and hold this, she said around the screw. I held up two sides of the cot and she put the screws in their holes. Then I heard the front door slam. Dad came in. He patted the green blanket on the baby shelf. Then he looked at the clay handprint you made for him in nursery school. He reached out for it, but his hand stayed in the air. Mom finished tightening the last screw. Now the cot had four sides. She let out a big breath and stood up slowly. Can you guys help me out? She said. Dad turned around. Mom rubbed her big belly. I need the mattress and bed springs from the garage. Okay said Dad. I followed Dad to the garage. He grabbed the springs leaning against the wall. What do you think? He asked. About having a new baby in the house. I'm glad, I said. I wanted to tell him it was pretty hard work being the only kid in a family, but I wasn't sure how he'd take it, so I said, it'll be fun. Dad and I lifted the springs together. They hurt my hands. We walked carefully down the hall. Alley-oop, said Dad as we hefted the springs over the side of the cot. Okay, now let it down real slow. Good. Next we got the mattress and lowered it onto the springs. The crib was all done except for sheets and stuff. Looks nice, said Mom. She ran her hand across the back of Dad's neck. Thanks, honey. Dad gave her a kiss. We decided to have some pizza and clean up the mess later. Day 154. Still. Dear Winnie, After dinner, we all went back to work in your room. I jammed used up paper and bits of string into a plastic bin bag. Mom put away the tools. Dad crushed the cardboard boxes flat. He always gets that job because he has the biggest feet. Dad stomped on another box, then looked around the room. Good paint job, he said. Will chose the colors, said Mom. Dad pointed to the wall above the cot where I'd put a hole in the clouds. Missed a spot, he said. I shook my head. No, I didn't. Dad gave me a funny look. I wanted the baby to know where Wenny is, I said. Mom put her hand to her mouth. I started to get that roller coaster feeling in my stomach. I knew I was going to tell them now. 
Mr. James wasn't there to help me. I had to do this by myself. I would just tell them the good part about flying. I died in the hospital when the doctors were trying to fix me. Mom nodded really slowly. We know. The doctors told us that when you came out of surgery. Well, I said, what you don't know is that when I died, something big happened to me. I floated up out of my body and I flew through a dark tunnel. Then I saw Wenny flying up ahead of me in a river of light. Dad put his arm around Mom. This a dream you had? He said. No, I said. It's what happened when I died. Wenny and I were zooming through the sky. It was really bright and colorful, and the light was all inside of me, like I'd swallowed it. You saw Wenny? whispered Mom. Yeah, but she flew ahead of me with the light person. I wanted to go with her, but I started thinking about you both being alone down in the world. And all of a sudden, I was back at the hospital, kind of floating in the corner of the ceiling. I saw you both in the waiting room. I tried to talk to you and tell you I was all right, but you couldn't hear me. Dad, I saw you knock over that paper cup and spill the water. Mom bent down to wipe up the water, and you got down on your knees. You were both crying. You put your arms around Mom, and you said... I stopped talking and dropped my bin bag on the floor. I hadn't meant to tell that part of the story. I was just going to say I'd seen Wenny. She was okay. She was happy. Said what, Will? I wanted to crawl inside the bin bag and curl up with the pizza crusts and bits of string. What did you hear me say? You said... Why did it have to be Wenny? The room went all quiet. My heart was bashing in my chest like a hammer. Then Dad sucked in a big breath like he'd just swum up from the bottom of the ocean. Will, he said. He put his hands on my shoulders. I didn't want to look at his face, but when I did, I saw blotches of color on his cheekbones. You mean you thought I wished you were killed instead of Wenny? He shook his head. No, he whispered. I didn't want either of one of you to die. Not my girl, and not my boy. He pulled me close. Mom came over and wrapped her arms around us, and we were all crying. We stood in the middle of your room. I was right in the middle of both of them, and it was the whole center of the world. I thought you wanted Wenny, I said. But I still came back. Mom rubbed my neck. Dad ran his hand across my head. Thanks for coming back, he said. Day 154, later. Dear Wenny, it's almost 8 o'clock and the world didn't come to an end. I think those psychics need to take some remedial math classes. It took me almost five months to fill out this book, but I'm on the last page, so this is my last letter to you for a while. I'm glad now I told Mom and Dad the whole story. It's good to know I was wrong about what Dad said in the waiting room that day. It's also good for Mom and Dad to know where you are, so they won't worry so much. I'm not angry with you anymore for flying ahead of me. I know you were just happy to be zooming around up there. We didn't make it all the way across the street on this world. I couldn't stop that truck. But I did fly you some of the way to heaven. I got you far enough along the bright road to see that nice light person. So I guess I did my job. Thank you for being your crazy happy self. For playing with me when there was no one else around and for singing me all those weird made up songs. I want you to remember no matter how many zillion angel friends you make up there, I want you to remember that I'm still your big brother. Love, Will.